there are so many similarities between Canada and Finland. First thing, it's cold. That's a, a common denominator. Uh, we, we don't get uh, the usual things that you would get in your neighboring country. So neighbors is the second uh, common denominator. We have a, a, a very big uh, neighbor to the east. Yours is to the south and ours is even scarier than yours. <laughs> then uh, another uh, commonality is that we actually celebrate this year. So in Finland we celebrate 100 years of independence. Your 50% more uh, when it comes to, to, to celebration, but that's a very big common denominator. Something less known, actually, which I think Dupes alluded to, is that we have several languages in both countries. So not everybody from Canada speaks English, some speak French, and not everybody from Finland speaks Finnish. Some of us, including me, speak Swedish, and so does Linus Turvalds, the uh, founder of, of the Linux operating system. But more importantly for this purpose and for the speech that I have here is a commonality in values. I think the countries are built on fairly similar values of egalitarianism, and the word's hard to pronounce, of, of, of having people, valuing people regardless of their uh, background and, and, and wealth and stuff. And that actually brings us to the value of open source. So open source for open good, that's the theme that I uh, am talking about and I will take that a bit deeper. I will look at uh, IT and business and freedom as a triad of things to try to combine and to serve with open source. So when it comes to employers and, and working and, and, and sort of my major fo focal point these days, it is a company called MariaDB. Dupes mentioned our uh, joint background in MySQL, the database, and the successor of MySQL is uh, MariaDB. We just got funding from uh, the uh, European Investment Bank and as those of you who know the uh, website called El Reg, the register, they uh, alluded to a Mon Monty Python film or uh, song when, when uh, announcing this uh, recent investment funding of open source. Finland, 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 a place to build open DBs. So that's the, the background in Finland. Moving on. So, the place that I hail from, that I start from, uh, is Finland, and the, the, the spot in Finland which is dearest to my heart is in a place called Nagu. We have 1,500 inhabitants, and we have 3,000 islands. So, Kingston, yes, you talk about 1,000 islands, well, this is part of the Archipelago Sea, uh, Nagu, and has, has 3,000 of them. So, um, in this place, I, I put all my old IT stuff and all my old information. You can see my granddad's typewriter from the 1950s here in my home office. And, and the starting point of this is the perspective of technology on human life, on whether it simplifies our lives, whether it actually solves our issues or whether it creates more issues by itself. And I think that the answer will be a bit of both. So I think there is progress. You see here my own typewriter, not my granddad's, it's from 1978 and it's an IBM one and it had a, a delete key. That's as high-tech as it was because there was a white stripe that you could, uh, if you press the delete key, it actually was so automated that you didn't have to uh, uh, use any, any, I don't know what these things are called in English, white paper that you put in front of the, the arms of the type, uh, right, that you could, you could use a delete with it. So, okay, that's, that's a starting point, and of course we are far away from that right now. But all the areas, and this is the point, all the areas where we see pro progress, 
we see something catching up to us, something actually eating up the progress. So the first area where there's lots of progress is memory. So this uh, so-called diskette had, I think, 300K on it, roughly, five and a quarter inch. So of course, any uh, phone these days has a multiple of it. But file sizes have eaten it up, and sloppiness when it comes to discipline about uh, zipping things and keeping things small have eaten up the progress in this area. Sadly, there's a pa pattern here. Um, there are other areas as well. Yes, this is one of my first phones that actually could take pictures, and they were lousy, but again, uh, the pixels that you get out of the res resolution will uh, represent a cost when it comes to processing them and showing them. So you have cameras everywhere, and that's fine. It's, it's really great to be able to remember flying here in Kingston, or seeing these thousand islands. By the way, we have 3,000. Um, and yet that will ha also impose a cost in the form of time. So we now spend our time looking through our phones and deleting the, the bad pictures and, and probably not even using these pictures because of the huge cost in time that they represent. So you, this is the same kind of thing, uh, the, the, the representing here now networking. The, the network speed uh, is, of course, highly uh, growing, and we, we, we have an easier time because of network speed being high. But guess what? Things are not under our own control. So if you look at the bit speed that is needed to transfer what you want to transfer, it's not very much that you would need out of the network. But because the devices have a life of their own and decide that they want to update just after you landed in a country where you uh, pay exorbitant amounts of money for uh, roaming, it means that you can't use uh, stuff that you really wanted to use. And this automated background task eats up also speed. So uh, I remember the, the first true microprocessor or, or uh, desktop computer, PC, uh, that I bought. It was in 1980. It booted in 0 0.2 seconds. Now, that's hard to beat these days. Of course, it, it, it just said A, B, C, 80, and there was a prompt, and you could write the basic command there. So you, you really couldn't do much after that. But it still booted in 0 0.2 seconds. GPS is a much better way to know where you are. And it's really easy here. I could help the taxi driver who drove me from uh, Montreal to Kingston by entering the um, name of the hotel into a GPS. He had used a paper device uh, like the one I have on the right hand side. Not, uh, not of Finland, though. Uh, that would not have brought him anyway. Uh, but um, given all these advantages of the GPS, they are also not at all under our control. And that is too bad, because th it, there would be so many things you could do if you really had control over your past tracks. Where have you been with your car? Where have you gone paddling amongst the one, uh, thousand islands? Where have you been running, uh, skiing on, with your boat, and so on? But these things are not under our control. They are under the control of a couple of players who uh, then give us uh, what they please and what is in their interest to uh, give us. So we have a lot of condescending apps. So I think then on top of this, all this new technology has created a new hassle for us. We have batteries that we have to charge for so many things. We have licenses. Not all licenses are GPL. Not all licenses are open source, which are friendly licenses which give lots of value for the end user and give them freedom, the freedom to hand over the software to others, the freedom to use it, the freedom to extend it, which is the core of open source. No, there are licenses which limit your, limit your use. And there are a number of licenses that you have to agree to and read before you start using an application. Well, nobody reads them. Very few people read, read them. And, and that, of course, again, gives power to somebody else than the user. 
There are passwords for your own protection. This is just in your own interest. You need these passwords. Yes, right. So passwords are a big, big issue when it comes to usability, and they are asked at the wrong moment in the wrong way. Upgrades. Yes, do you want to upgrade now or later? Well, guess what? I wouldn't want to upgrade at all. I would want it to work from the, from the beginning. That's what upgrades should be like, and they should be as invisible as possible and not happen when I am on a tight bandwidth or tight schedule. Um, it, we have come to a point where it's easier to use pen and paper because it doesn't get time uh, require us to reboot things, and when I bring my pen and paper, it doesn't ask me whether I also want to, and then something else. Data loss, yep. If you, the more reliant we are on technology, the easier it is to lose data. And last, and a, a really big one, privacy. So to get into this country, I had to fill in quite a lot of information. I don't mind the likes of, of Justin Trudeau knowing those things, but you never know when you get your own variety of a, of a person managing this country that you wouldn't want this information uh, in that person's hands. And when it comes to privacy, people appeal to us and say, but you don't, you don't have anything to hide, you're not doing anything illegal, you're not doing anything improper. Of course, um, for you, that's not an issue. They, uh, we are being implied to, to think. But I'm not so sure. What about your future plans? Do you want them to be open to everybody? If you change a career, do you want your current employer to know about your change plans? Or if you move to a different place, or if you, there are changes in your relationship? Those are things that I'll, I'd call private trade secrets. So ongoing transactions, no, I have things to hide there, and I, I am not thinking of anything unethical. I'm just thinking of stuff that shouldn't reach everybody's ears uh, immediately. And the more uh, we give information to technology, the uh, easier we will be get, getting caught by these things. What also follows from this is a dependence on individual vendors for price, for quality, for innovation. I think innovation happens when there's an underdog that is powerful, an underdog that is uh, creative and knows how things should be done. We've seen that with a number of companies. That there, there was a point in time when, when my country, Finland, uh, was quite innovative in, in, in uh, telephony and, and IT with Nokia. We've seen Apple go through such a phase, but once there is an uh, established power relation, the innovation actually doesn't, start, doesn't, doesn't continue at the same, same pace. So we, we see here, during different decades in the past, there have been individual vendors that there has been dependency on, and the, the balance of price, quality, and innovation has suffered uh, when the incumbents get too big. Another topic of mine has nothing to do in principle with technology, uh, but with society as a whole, where technology serves society and, and politics. So, you would say that technology is neutral or for the good uh, when it comes to human society progressing. Well, I'm not so sure uh, that it is for the good. At most, technology is neutral. It can be put at the service of any kind of, of, of ethical values. And, and I uh, would like those ethical values to be based on how uh, Western society was built and not on any random and particularly uh, religious values that, that don't represent uh, uh, the good of, of humanity as such. So my proposal when it comes to looking at technology is to, look, to return to the core Western values. And here are two of my favorite guys, um, Immanuel Kant with a categorical imperative 
about do unto others as you would want them to do unto you, but phrased in a more, shall we say, abstract manner, behave in such a way that the maxim guiding your behavior could be uplifted to a general law. And then Montesquieu, by separating the different, different powers, I think technology cannot be oblivious, cannot, cannot be blind to what kind of a society it serves. Today we see oversimplification. Here are two things that I to, uh, somehow got to, during my youth. Um, on the left we have a bust of, of uh, Vladimir Ilyich Lenin uh, that I bought as a prop sometimes the first time I visited the so Soviet Union. And to the right I think you know who that guy is. And we're sort of... Uh, pretending to have to choose between one of these two. And I think that is a, a blatant oversimplification. There are good things represented by each of those uh, symbols, and they have both been misused gravely. And using open source, I truly believe that you can combine, for technology, using technology, you can combine business and freedom. It is not an impossible equation, but you have to be conscious of uh, these things. You have to be conscious of the, uh, shall we say, moral obligations as a technologist that you have. Rounding up on this ethical side, the dimension of open source in its wider sense, I have a couple of people that I think we should be very grateful towards that I've listed here. So the first ethics IT edition slide here on freedom is about uh, intellectual property. We have L Lawrence Larry Lessig and Eben Moglen. The guy to the left is the father of how to apply copyright to situations where you do not want to live it but to enable the users of your intellectual property. The copy left, where, where Creative Commons is, is enabling the further use of your materials, much in the way that, that humanity has used it all the time. So the uh, Gebrüder Grimm, the Br Grimm brothers, actually didn't write all of their stories themselves. They collected what had been public knowledge and they packaged it and they made it consumable for a large group of people. Now, Disney took, this, took uh, what, what the Green Brothers had done and didn't pay the Green Brothers or those who, who are the um, inheritors of, of Green Brothers anything. And I think that's just fine. But the same should apply now. So we should now have a situation where we can build upon those who came before us in, when it comes to IP. Eben Boglen, Boglen is, is the lawyer behind the uh, general public license, the most known open source license, a, a great mind when it comes to uh, enforcing freedom of open source, or freedom of software. And looking specifically then at open source, the guy on the right, Linus Torvalds, a fellow uh, Finn, uh, is known to, I believe, all of you, so the creator of uh, Linux, the operating system. The guy to the left, Rick Falkwing, it might not be known to you, is very known in most of Europe, the creator of the first uh, pirate party, which on their agenda have uh, uh, issues related to IP and freedom uh, from copyright uh, on uh, uh, on the top, and they actually, in, in some European countries, spe specifically Iceland, are, have, have been very, very successful. And then the last slide here actually contains a picture of a very good friend of mine whom I learned already when we went to school together. So that's the guy behind the MySQL database and nowadays behind the MariaDB database. Uh, the creator of, of, of a database, which also provides the world with lots of freedom. And I think we can grow business based on that. You can see that from the track record of MySQL. So that is sort of a, a, 
commonality of these, these, these people, you can create something good for humanity, but still lead a very good life yourself. You can have open source for open good. Thank you.